So today we're going to visit Historic Woodland Cemetery in Monroe, Michigan, and I think kind of by accident, we're also going to be visiting Trinity Lutheran Cemetery. Now it's really weird, these two cemeteries are actually right next to each other, and there is no dividing line between the two, and I thought I was in Woodland Cemetery when I did my first grave site, and apparently when I looked it up online, I was actually in Trinity. So Woodland Cemetery is one of the oldest cemeteries, not only in Monroe County, Michigan, but one of the oldest cemeteries in the state of Michigan itself. It's also one of the first cemeteries in the state that allowed the burying of black Americans. Here are some of Monroe's pioneers, distinguished citizens and politicians and veterans from every U.S. military conflict from the Revolutionary War to Vietnam. But none are as famous as some of those you will find buried in the Custer family plot. Here you will find Boston Custer, General George Armstrong Custer's younger brother, and Audie Reed, his nephew, who were both killed at the Battle of Little Bighorn. The Custer family grave site is located not too far from the entrance. Take the first road at the top of the hill all the way back down to the bottom of the hill. Make a left here and the plot will be about 30 yards down on your left, just a little bit off the road. And while this is the Custer family plot, General George Armstrong Custer is not buried here. 40 grave sites that are here were purchased about two years after the general died. General Armstrong is buried at West Point Military Academy in New York. Buried here are the general's parents, Emmanuel and Maria. Two nephews who also served in the United States Army, his brother Boston and his nephew Audie Reed who died in 1876 at the Battle of Little Bighorn alongside General Custer. My first grave site to visit today is that of Civil War Congressional Medal of Honor winner Private Peter Seip who was buried in Trinity Cemetery. Even though Mr. Seip was from Michigan, he served as a private with Company B and 47th Ohio Infantry. According to family history, he had originally enlisted in a Michigan unit, but his mother went to the Army leadership and took him out since he was still officially a minor. But Mr. Sipe was not to be deterred from embarking on his military career and enlisted as a private with the Ohio unit in Adrian, Michigan on June 15, 1861 at 19 years old. I could find no information on how old he was the first time he tried to enlist. His company saw service in Virginia in West Virginia before being sent to Mississippi to be part of the attack on Vicksburg, Mississippi. During the Battle of Vicksburg, Peter Sipe was part of a group of soldiers who volunteered to guard a shipment of goods that the Union attempted to run past the Confederate blockade. This attempt was made on the night of May 3, 1863, and the Union forces were both shot at and shelled by the rebel forces. One of the shells made a direct hit on the steamship that was transporting goods, and the ship disappeared in a hail of fire and steam. Family history says that Peter had an opportunity to make it back to the Louisiana side of the river but gave up his spot on a plank of wood, which was a remnant of the steamship, to other soldiers. So family history at this point states that when he did make it back to shore, he was taken prisoner of war by the Confederates. Now I searched the prisoner of war records. I don't doubt the family history, but I could not find anything stating that he was a prisoner of war and being held by the Confederates. According to records, Peter Seip continued to serve with the 47th Ohio Infantry in the June of 1864, where he was wounded near Kennesaw Mountain, Georgia. He was then mustered out of the service after recovering from his wounds. A month before his 60th birthday, on September 12, 1911, Peter was awarded the Medal of Honor. The award reads, For extraordinary heroism, on 3 May 1863, while serving with Company B, 47th Ohio Infantry in action at Vicksburg, Mississippi, Private Sipe was one of a party that volunteered and attempted to run the enemy's batteries with a steam tug and two barges loaded with subsistence stores. Now, one other thing to note while I was researching Private Sipe was that his headstone shows that he passed away April 20th, 1923, but the article written by one of his relatives later on shows that he died in 1912, so I'm not quite sure which is right and which is wrong.
The next gravesite I visited is actually two, father and son, who are buried next to each other, Lloyd J. Bodell and his son, Lloyd E. Bodell. The senior Bodell was killed during World War I fighting Germans, while his son was killed during World War II when his plane, the Jaunty Joe, crashed on a bombing run. From information I found, Corporal Bodell, the senior, died of his wounds while fighting the Germans in Almignol, France. He left behind a wife and a four-month-old son. That four-month-old son grew up, joined the service, and became a first lieutenant in the 345th Army Air Force Bomber Group. On May 26, 1945, 16B-25J Mitchell bombers took off from their base in the Philippines headed for Taiwan. They were carrying out bombing missions against shipping along the China coast, as well as industrial and infrastructure targets in Taiwan. Lieutenant Bodell was a navigator on the Jaunty Joe, which crashed after dropping its bomb load during a bombing mission raid on the Bai or Tsu refinery located in northwestern Taiwanese city of Maioi. U.S. intelligence, which had identified the refinery as target number 85 on Taiwan, estimated it produced 100,000 barrels of gasoline, kerosene and heavy oils annually. It was a target of some significance. Jaunty Joe crashed near a train station in the city of Maioi. All five crew members of the Jaunty Joe were killed. My next visit is to the grave site of Corporal Edward F. Overmeyer who is the great-grandson of Revolutionary War Captain John George Overmeyer. Edward Overmeyer enlisted in the Union Army in Fremont, Ohio on May 2, 1864, and was discharged on September 4, 1864 due to ill health. He remained in ill health the rest of his life. My next grave site is that of William Brown, who enlisted in the Union Army as a private on August 24, 1862, at the age of 36, where he was signed to Company A, 4th Michigan Infantry Regiment. He received a disability discharge from the Army on December 31, 1862, at Falmouth, Virginia, for chronic rheumatism. He was a member of the Monroe, Michigan Grand Army of the Republic Post. Brown was a farmer who could not read or write and he passed away at a little over 86 years old. Crazy Winan served in the U.S. Army and fought in the Mexican War and the Civil War. His headstone states he served with the 7th Michigan Infantry, obtaining the rank of Colonel. After returning to the Monroe, Michigan area, he was sheriff in 1848, and then in 1854, he was appointed to Postmaster General. In 1856, he was elected alderman of the 2nd Ward. Jeremiah Lawrence served in the Revolutionary War. After the war, he settled in Monroe County, Michigan, and when Monroe Township was being formed, he ran for several offices and eventually winning a seat as a township assessor in 1827. Stephen Downing served in the Continental Army from 1776 until 1778, enlisting at Canterbury, Connecticut in 1776 for six months and 1777 at New London for six months and 1778 for nine months under Captain Joseph Durkee. According to military records at the U.S. Department of Interior, he is listed as a private. After his discharge from the Army, he served as a privateer in 1779 and in 1780 on two ships. He also served as a privateer on the ship the Young Cromwell, which took three prizes and was shipwrecked at Cape Fear Shoals, North Carolina. He returned home by land, enlisting for six months in 1780 aboard the privateer Marquis Lafayette. He also served in the War of 1812 with two of his sons. My last stop for the day is the gravesite of Philip S. Gibson. Mr. Gibson was shot and killed by his ex-girlfriend's mother. Court records indicate at her trial that Mr. Gibson and his ex-girlfriend's family had a turbulent relationship. A friend of Mr. Gibson who was with him all day testified that on the day of the incident Mr. Gibson's ex-girlfriend's mother called both him and Mr. Gibson requesting that 
they come by the house to pick up his clothing. According to court records, one of the mother's friends also called Mr. Gibson on the mother's behalf and requested that he come by the mother's house to pick up his clothes. Mr. Gibson, driven by the same friend he had been with all day, arrived at his ex-girlfriend's mother's house at around 9.08 p.m. Mr. Gibson was seated in the passenger side of the pickup truck. According to the driver, when they pulled up, he left the truck running because he expected to be there only for a short time. The mother came down the stairs carrying clothes on top of both of her hands. The driver states he did not see a weapon. The ex-girlfriend's mother bypassed the driver's side of the truck and went around the front of the truck to the passenger side. When she arrived at the passenger side, she asked Mr. Gibson if the clothes belonged to him and when he responded affirmly, she said, well, here's your shirt, motherfucker, and shot the victim three times, striking the victim once in the ear and once in the cheek. The driver states he saw the mother holding the gun after the first shot, following which he stated he ducked down and floored the truck, and at the end of the block, he called 911. The driver testified the victim did not do anything to provoke the mother and that he did not have a weapon. News reports in the Toledo Blade at the time of his murder states that Mr. Gibson had 19 arrests on his police record, some of those being for domestic violence. It is unknown at the time of the article if any of those were for the ex-girlfriend. Thank you.